you better straighten up and fly right then. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> We bless God this morning. We thank him for his goodness and thank God for each one of you. I just appreciate God for the gift that you are to us. And uh, I just praise God for fellowship. I thank God for this fellowship. And uh, I appreciate you for pressing your way. You know, uh, sometimes it's just a press, you know. And um, I do believe, though, that it's a blessing in the press when you can press your way on through your troubles, your situations, uh, obstacles that's in your way, your um, environment, you can press your way. You best believe there's something waiting on you. And so I thank God uh, that you made it through the press this morning. I thank God that you're here. And again, I say it all the time that I don't have to teach to the seats. And so it's just a blessing. If you will, open up your Bibles to the book of Colossians. Colossians, and so we are going to take a slow roll again as um, we are going through uh, this book and, and uh, just doing what we do here at Manasseh Christian Fellowship. So we don't want you to come and, and when you leave, so oh, they didn't talk about nothing. We want to have the, <laughs> we want you to get some word while you're here, Amen. Amen. And so that is what we endeavor to do. So Colossians is one of the epistles. Everybody say epistle. Epistle is just another word for letter. Just another word for letter. So it's one of the letters that Paul wrote. So we call it the Pauline epistles. And you know that's where we say that's where we get the doctrine from that we talk about. When we talk about grace changed everything, we find that out in uh, the Pauline epistles. Now, you can see grace from the beginning of the Bible until the end. Let me just say that, okay? But we find out who we are uh, in the Pauline epistles. So Paul wrote this book, as he did several others, during his uh, first Roman imprisonment. And so we've already gone through Ephesians, we, and the others are Philippians and Philemon, or Philemon. Some people say it like that. But... Um, this particular church, this uh, body of believers, was probably started, it was probably started during Paul's third missionary journey. And it was composed mainly of Gentile believers. Okay, now who are Gentiles? Who are Gentiles? Anyone, but, but Jew. Anyone who's not a Jew. All right, y'all, come on now, talk back to me. Uh, and so... Paul had intended to visit the church upon his release from prison, but at the time, of, he had never visited them at the time of this writing. So uh, they may have met in the home of uh, Philemon, because he lived there in Colossae uh, with one of his slaves, Onesimus. And so you can look at that, uh, you can see that, uh, in Colossians 4 and 9, but we won't turn there. And so it was written, here, here's, here's the deal. This book was written explicitly to tear down, to defeat the heresy that had arisen in Colossae. And when, when, when you talk about heresy, uh, what are we talking about? Does anyone know? Can you give me like a brief definition of heresy? Com- <laughs> okay, so false doctrine, false doctrine, and someone said that I hear confusion, and did I hear something else? Okay, okay, absolutely, absolutely, so anything that goes against well, well, the truth, <laughs> anything that goes against the truth, and so uh, anything that goes against the truth is an endangerment to the church. Anything that goes against the truth is an endangerment to the truth. Now, we just talked, we just came out of the book of Ephesians. The thing to help us battle against that is putting on the whole armor of God, putting on the whole armor of God to help us to battle that because as long as you live, there's going to be a battle against what's true and what's false. And so when we have the word, Mother Nan, down on the inside of us, then we won't be tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. 
And so you've got to have the truth down. That's why it's so important, Brother Hughes, when we talk about getting the word, when we talk about all the word you can, when you can, when you can. So we get that to fight against uh, the false doctrine that's going to come against us because every one of us will be faced with it. We're going to be faced with it. And so this letter was written in response to what was going on, even though he had never been there before. So here was the heresy that uh, was involved. Sometime uh, after this church was first started, it was uh, infected with something called Gnosticism. Everybody say that, Gnosticism, Gnosticism. It comes from the word gnosis. Everybody say gnosis. Gnosis, okay? So when you think about the word gnosis, you think about the word to know. To know. And when we think about the word to know, we automatically think about knowledge. Knowledge. So (laughs) there was a fight against knowledge, false knowledge, and what was true. And what was true. And so it represented, when you look at this form of Judaistic Gnosticism, it represented the worst of both the Jewish and the Greek world of thought. Because when you think about uh, the Jews in this sense, remember now how legalistic they were. And when you come up against the Greek thought, remember, their big thing was philosophy and the knowledge that they have. So if those two things come together and meet, you just got a whole mess. You just got a whole mess. And so here are some of the things that Paul was writing uh, to defeat. This form of thought said that salvation can be obtained only through knowledge. Salvation can be obtained only through knowledge. So what this means is that those who had superior intellect could hope to achieve salvation, and that would leave out a whole lot of people. That would leave out a whole lot. So we already know that that's false, right? Why? Because salvation is open for everyone. And salvation is not by knowledge, but salvation is by grace. Yeah. And so we already know that, that that's a whole, it just, it's just all off. It's all off. The other thing that this school of thought says is that faith was silly and useless. Well, now, you know, we, mm-mm, mm-mm. No, uh, we know that it's impossible to please God without faith. So they're saying, what they were saying is that, you know, if, with all of this superior knowledge, you got to see something to believe something. And so that was already, already off. And they said that the material, the material world, or matter, if you will, is evil. And so what they said was, is that a holy God could not come into this evil world and, 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 and create this evil world. He's too holy for that. Well, they, they said that in order for him to do that, he created, he would have to create something, and then that something would have to create something else, and then that something would have to create something else not giving him his preeminence, not giving him his preeminence. Now, you know, um, they said, okay, so he created something, an angel. An angel created another angel. An angel created another angel. An angel created another angel. And then the final angel created the world as we know it today. So they denied the fact that God is in everything. He said he existed, but that he wasn't in everything. And so that's heresy. That's heresy. And so now Paul is getting ready to write to refute everything. This is the kind of thing that they were being taught or that the false teachers came in to say. 
And so that the false teachers, it included a combination, as I said earlier, of Jew Jewish legalism, yeah. Eastern philosophy, pagan astrology, mysticism, asceticism. It, 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 it had a whole lot of things going on. They were either on this end or that end. Uh, and so the false teachers claimed that they were not denying the Christian faith, but only lifting it up to a higher level. Beware. Beware. There are people today that, that think that they can take you to a higher plane of thought. There are people today who think that they can give you more than what Jesus Christ has already given you. And so he was fighting that then. Uh, giving that to the church at Colossae, and that's happening right now. That's happening right now. It's something that we have to guard ourselves against today. So they offered fullness. Now, check this out, fullness and freedom. They offered a satisfying life that solved all the problems that people face. And that this is important for us because, you know, there's a plethora of uh, self-help, and, and, and I'm not against that, but I'm saying these are things that we have to guard ourselves against because there is a lot of information out there that's saying you can have a better life if you thought like this. You can have a better life if you did this. When Colossians, Paul says, in Jesus Christ, there is the fullness is already there. You already have the fullness. And remember, you don't need anything else because you are complete. Everybody say complete. complete. You are complete in him. So stop seeking after mysticism. Stop seeking after those things that's in the stars and reading the stars and reading your palm and reading that. You stop that because you don't need any of that. Jesus Christ has already gone to the cross so that you can experience the fullness of life. And Paul was so smart, he took their terminology and he turned it around on them. When they're saying that we can show you to a better way, we can show you to a life that's full, Paul used that same terminology and said, you are already full. You got just what you need. He was so, so smart. And so... The letter Paul wrote to the Ephesians, as one, the book we just covered, was written and sent about the same time as this letter. So when we began to study Colossians, you're going to see that there are some obvious parallels. Some actually sounds so much like what we've already studied in Ephesians. Now, the emphasis in the book of Ephesians is on the church, the body of Christ. All right. But when we get to Colossians, what we're going to see is that it flips. The emphasis is on Christ, mm -hmm. the head of the body. You've got to know that, that he's the head for a reason. He's the head for a reason. And when you have a head, everything follows from the head. And so the main theme, as I have already alluded to, is the preeminence of Jesus Christ. The preeminence of Jesus Christ. I want to go to a verse and then we'll go back to the first verse. Let's go to Colossians 1 and 18. Are you there? Before you get there, I just want to emphasize preeminence. Preeminence means to be first. It comes from the word proyuo, which is another uh, derivative of uh, prototype. You know how Paul says that he was ch the chief of sinners? Mm -hmm. Then uh, that word chief uh, means first or prototype. And so this word preeminence is a form of that same word. It means to be first. It means to hold first place in rank or first place in influence. So in Colossians 1 and 18, Paul says this. He says, and he is the head of the body. Who is he? 
Christ. And he is the head of the body. The head means the first, okay? He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. All things come from him. By him, all things consist. He holds the world in his hands. Everything is held together by him. Everything. And so go to uh, Colossians, the third chapter and the 11th verse. Now, if he's big enough to hold the whole world together, do you think that he's big enough to hold you together when you're going through whatever it is that you're going through? Do you think that he can take care of your problems? Look, the things that you're going through, are, 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 they, I know they're big. Don't get me wrong, and I'm not discounting that, and I'm not downplaying that. But if he's big enough to hold this whole world together, if he's big enough to keep those birds up in the air, if he's big enough to keep everything turning and moving the way that it's supposed to, look, our problems, he can handle them just like that. He's big enough to take us through them. He really is. And so in Colossians, the third chapter and the 11th verse, it says, uh, you know, you have to read it in context, but you'll get the gist of it. It says, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Christ is all and in all. When I was coming up, my mother and them used to sing that song. Jesus is all. He is all. The world of me. He is all. He is all. And so he is all and in all. And so go back to the first chapter. There is no need for us when, when, when the Gnostics were talking about having an uh, angel to come down to be the one to mediate for for us or that, that, that they were uh, emanated from God and then there was another one that came and another one that, there's no need for that. There's no need for any of that because God has sent his son to die for us. Amen. He sent his son to die for us. And so everyone who believes on Jesus Christ, everyone who's saved and is a part of his body, uh, the church of which he is the head, we are united to Christ, and that is a wonderful relationship. Amen. Amen. We're united with him, and that is a wonderful relationship. And so there is nothing, there's nothing that needs to be added to this relationship because, as I said earlier, we're all complete in him. Okay, let's start. Paul an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul always prays for those that he's writing to. And I say again, you, we, we, let's just thank God for prayer warriors, and let's thank God for those prayers that have been sent up for us. Because, Sister Cynthia, so many times, Brother Marcus, I say it like this, so many times I've been in a place where I couldn't pray for myself. I've been in a place where I didn't want to pray, Christy. I've just been in a dark place. And so when you got somebody going to God on your behalf, that's something mighty special. And so I thank God for prayer warriors. I thank God for intercessors. And when, when it comes to you, when you're thinking about someone, when you're, when you're wondering, you know, what's going on, just stop for a moment and say a prayer. Stop for a moment and say a prayer. When you see someone and you know you can just tell something is a little bit off, you, and you can tell. You can tell if you got the spirit of God on the inside of you. It, it will, the spirit will speak to you. Just say a little prayer. Amen. Just say a little prayer. You don't have to know what's, what it is. You don't have to get into nobody's business, but you just say, Lord, just, just help them and take care of them. Lord, just fix it. 
like you can. And don't you know he will? You know what? We serve God. I know we serve God who is a fixer. And I know sometimes we say he's a mind regulator, but let me tell you something, that he'll fix it, and he'll fix it like nobody can. He'll fix it for you. I know he will. I know he will. You know, the thing about it, too, is we get so confused, and this is, this is what happens, and this is when, 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 when someone like the Gnostics can come in and, 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 and get our ear, because sometimes when we're going through, we get so confused, and all we want is just a little bit of relief. And if somebody is telling us that they can make us feel better, then we're going to listen to that. But Paul wants them to know you don't have to just guard yourself, put on the whole armor of God, and uh, just trust, just trust him. And so then when they're talking about faith is silly, we know that you got to trust him. We know that you got to put your trust in him. And now we know this too. We know he may not always come when you want him. Somebody say it. Somebody say it again. Say it for the people in the back. He's right on time. Always. Always. Perfectly on time. Oh, some of us been waiting for a long time. Some of us been waiting for a long time. But I tell you what, I heard somebody say yesterday when I was at a funeral that God is not a man that he should lie. Not a son of man that he should repent. If he said it, he will do it. If he spoke it, it's going to come to pass. You can believe that. You can believe that. Oh, it may not come when you want it, but he's going to come right on time. Right on time. And so what we have to do is trust him. We have to trust him. And you know what we said? We believe us. And all that is is that we trust him. We trust him. We trust his word. When we say we're believers, we believe what the word says. We believe what the word says. And so then he says here, Paul, as he's praying, he said, we give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always. I've never met you, but I'm praying for you. Paul had never been there, but he said, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. You know, he told, he said, he said this at, in one place, at one church, he said, I'm praying that the eyes of your understanding be enlightened. That they may be enlightened. And I want, he, he wanted the same thing for the Colossians. Right. I want your mind to be enlightened. Right. He said, I want your mind to be enlightened. I want you to know that there is nothing else that can be added or that needs to be added to this relationship that you have in Christ Jesus. He says, since we heard of your faith, in Christ Jesus, and of the love which ye have to all the saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. Look, he says, since we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, and of the love which ye have to all the saints, and for the hope, yes, yes. faith, hope, love, faith, hope, Love, faith, hope, love. If we are believers this morning, that's what should be dominating our thinking. Yes. Faith, hope, and love. Faith, hope, and love. Y'all, we can make it. We can make it. We can make it. With faith, hope, and love, we can make it. It may not always be bright sun shining. It might be cloudy like it is today. But you know what? We can make it. We can make it. We trust him. We trust him. And so uh, he says in verse 6, which is come unto you as it is in all the world and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you since the day ye heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth. That's what's going to happen. You're going to yield fruit. Once you believe, once you believe, once you, your thinking is centered on faith, hope, and love, you will produce fruit. And uh, it says, as ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the spirit. 
For this cause, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge. You see how he keep using that word there, knowledge, because that was the thing that the Gnostics were trying to say. You need more knowledge. And so he says that ye might be filled with the knowledge of not some philosophy or, or not something else that's just going to have you going around in circles, but that ye may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who have delivered us, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. Listen, let me get to this verse and then we'll go on. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. So when, when Paul started this, he didn't start by attacking because, you know, he knew they were all off and they were all wrong. But he didn't start out attacking them. Mm -mm, no, he didn't start out attacking them. But what he did was he started out by telling them who Jesus Christ all is. Right. And he started out by telling them what Jesus Christ has done for them. He started out, he began by exalting Jesus Christ, putting him in his proper place and showing that he is preeminent over all things. Preeminence, he showed it in the gospel message and the redemption that Christ has given us in creation. And he showed his preeminence in the church. And then Paul ended it by showing the preeminence that God had in his own life. He says, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created. Letting you know that, no, he came down, and, I, you know, pastor says all, all the time that he'll roll, up his, uh, he'll roll up his sleeves and he'll come down where, to where you are. No, you don't need an angel for that because he's done that. He's done that. He's not, he's not so holy that he can't come down to touch you. Okay? And so that's all he was trying to tell because they were saying that everything was just inherently evil. Everything was evil and that God was too holy to get involved with everything that was evil. But now we know if that's the case, then we never would be saved. And so it says, for by him all, were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him. And not just by him, but all things were created for him. And he is before all things. And by him, all things consist. All things consist. And so um, when, we, when we look at this, we look at the fact that Paul is letting them know that there is nothing, that, that he's the first. He's the first. You know, several things, when you talk about him being first, you're talking about him being the head. You're talking about him being the leader. You're talking about him being the ruler. You're talking about him being over everything. That word, preeminence. That's what you know, just, he is whatever you need him to be. He is whatever you need him to be. And so... Once he has established the preeminence of Christ, then he starts attacking them and talking to them in their own language and on their own ground. Letting them know you think that you can have a fullness of life by the rhetoric that you spout. And y'all, that's a lot of what's going on today. A lot of what's going on today is rhetoric. You know, when, when I say rhetoric, you know what I mean when I say rhetoric. I mean it's not coming to... It's not coming to, it's no substance. It's just a bunch of words. It's rhetoric. 
Now, um, Paul says here, he says, where did I stop y'all? 17, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Thank you so much. And he is the head of the body. And what is the body? The church. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, letting them know he is preeminent. He who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father mm -hmm. that in him should all fullness dwell. He's using their words back on them. He's using their words because they use fullness. We can't, the, what we're teaching you will give you a full life. So he turns it back on them and says, no, no, for it pleased the Father that in him, in Jesus Christ, should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself by him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. So when you talk about, uh, when you talk about in him, uh, that all things dwell. Now, now the father, the, the father had enough. The father, look, felt like, okay, Jesus Christ, I'm okay by giving him control over all things. Because remember now, God, Jesus, they're one. They're one. They're one. So is it, and I'm not just going to give it to him and take it back. I'm going to give it to him permanently. I'm going to give it to him permanently. I'm confident that he can handle it. I'm confident with that. And so uh, it pleased the father that in him should all fullness dwell. He says, and you that were sometime alienated, and I'm in verse 21, and enemies in your mind by wicked works, Yet now have he reconciled, letting them know, okay, if, 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 if God is who the Gnostics say that he is, or if he acts the way that they say that he does, if he is too holy to come into contact with something that's evil, well, what, how do you think you got to be where you are? All right. How do you think you got to be where you are? Now, you've been called out of all of that. You, you, were, you were once that way. You were once that way. But now, you were reconciled. You having made peace through the blood of the cross by him to reconcile all things. And the only way that he could do that is for God to get involved. And that is by Jesus coming down. Jesus coming down and putting on flesh. Jesus coming down, not only putting on flesh, but Jesus dying for us and making peace. That's the only way that that could happen. So in other words, what you're being taught or what you're hearing has to be false. It has to be false. It has to be foolishness. And so um, Paul was saying to him, see, they were confused. The false teachers were confused in their thinking. If they were thinking, as I and I'm keep I keep alluding to that, if they were teaching that matter was evil, including the human body, then they also taught that Jesus Christ did not have a real body. Since this would have put him in contact with evil matter. All the way off. And so the results of that, the results of those, the false teaching, is tragic, tragic. One thing, y'all, Satan is a, a deceiver. Yes. Satan is a deceiver. And what he does is he wants to come, and we say he's a distractor as well. He's a distractor. Anything to throw you off, anything to throw you off, that's what he will do. And so, and, uh, just, just tragic, because see, they were teaching on the one hand 
you know, that you know, this is evil, that is evil, and then they were, were teaching on the other hand, there's, you shouldn't enjoy anything in this life. You know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't have any pleasure in this life. Well, y'all know we would be real sad. Amen. <laughs> Wouldn't we? Wouldn't we? So, you know, there's got to, you, the, the, all backwards, all backwards. And so that's why you have to have uh, the whole armor of God, and then you have to have a spirit of discernment so that you can uh, understand what the devil really is trying to do. He says in verse 22, in the body of his flesh through death to present you, holy and unblameable, unblameable without blemish, uh, unreprovable, to present you um, holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If ye continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard and which was preached to every creature, which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation, the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you, to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery, the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. And we know as we talked about Ephesians, we know that the mystery was the coming together, the Jews and the Gentiles into one body, that that was a dispensation that was given to Paul and Paul to give to us in these Pauline epistles. And so, um, you know, it was in the mind of God the entire time from eternity's past, but just reveal when God gave it to Paul. He says, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, mm -hmm. which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Mm -hmm. Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom mm -hmm. that we may present every man perfect in Jesus Christ. I'm going to end with this verse. Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily, mightily. And, and that means to the point of exhaustion. I'm going to do this until I can't do it anymore. And that's what Paul said. Paul, Paul said, I got to preach. I might be in prison and I might be out of prison, but I got to preach because that's what God called me to do. When he first opened up this book, he says, I'm an apostle. And what that simply means, Brother Hughes, is that I'm a messenger and I didn't send myself but I've been sent by God and I'm going to spread this word. I'm going to spread this word until I cannot spread it anymore. And we see that it was needed. It was needed, even though he was in prison because he said, if one place, beware, there's going to come wolves coming in after you to try to snatch away what's been placed in you. But you got to stand guard so that you can hold on to what you know is the truth. Give the Lord a hand praise, everybody.